Welcome back, people. Another episode of Rogers Rules. We've missed you. And I know you got a little bit of the show last week during the College World Series, which was a blast. We'll get into that. But it, I'm happy to be back in the chair with my man, Cam Broham, on the other side. Cam, how we doing? What up, Andrew? Hey, so happy Bobby Bonilla. <laughs> bu happy belated Bobby Bonilla Day, I should say. Oh, when was it? It was yesterday, July yesterday. 1st. All right, we missed it. So, do you know who Bobby Bonilla is? So the name sounds name sounds familiar, but I couldn't tell you exactly what his historical marking in in the world is. I love breaking down Bobby Bonilla Day for people that don't know. Like it's <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to do. So Bobby Bonilla played for the New York Mets um, in the two thousand to two thousand and ten range. Okay, so he was up for uh, a good amount of money. Okay, and. His salary was restructured, and here's why. Okay, so we hear about all these contract restructurings and uh, um, like payouts that happen over time after the player is like through their contract. Like Shohei Otani is a great example. He just signed what like a a massive deal with the Dodgers, but instead of taking his Twenty million per year right now. He's only taking two million, and then once that contract's up for the next twenty years after the Dodgers are going, or the next ten years, whatever it is, the Dodgers are going to be paying him eighteen million dollars a year to not play on their team. Right. So that's kind of like what this deal was for Bobby Bonilla. Okay. So in two thousand, the Mets agreed to buy out the remaining five point million on his contract. But instead of paying Bonilla at the time, so this is a little bit different. It's, it's, it's not like this is a buyout versus a contract offer with Otani, but right. you get the picture. So instead of paying Bonilla $5.9 million at the time, the Mets agreed to make annual payments of $1.2 million for 25 years starting on July 1st, 2011. And included into that, was a negotiated 8% interest. So just in five years' time, it should be paid off, right, based on what he was set to make. But the the weird thing about it is you're like, is the math still doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. $1.2 for 25 years, why wouldn't you just pay him the 5.9? Well, Mets ownership at the time invested in the, the infamous Bertie Madoff. Uh. And they were expecting double-digit returns on the the amount of money that they put in his hands well people know the bernie madoff story nobody made any money <laughs> except for madoff and yeah. he made a lot of um you know enemies and uh gathered that's a lot time. of prison time yeah that's <laughs> at, the, at the same time so the mets were out right but what do you do with bobby Bonilla? you still gotta pay him you sign the dotted line mm -hmm. so for so cam from 2011 to 2035, okay. when he'll be 72 years old. He's still getting a million Bobby, plus. Bobby Bonilla is getting a million plus. Every year. Every year until he's oh, 72. That's great. Happy for him. Good job, Bobby. And, you know, the best part about this whole story is Mets ownership, like when Steve Cohen took over the team, and he's like one of the richest owners in sports history, he didn't, you know, kick dirt. He didn't like come at this with a negative, um, like a negative persona. It was, no, let's celebrate this day. Let, let's have Mets fans literally celebrate this day. It's been great publicity for the New York Mets. You're out a ton of money, but do they really need the money? Bobby Bonilla, no joke, is living large. He has the best, the best deal ever written in sports history. Heck yeah. No, I'd, I'd take that in a minute. <laughs> so uh, this arrangement's very rare. It, let's just say a lot of teams haven't made the same mistake uh, that the New York Mets made in the year 2000. But I will read a few, um, some, some other notable deferred money contracts. Okay, and this is courtesy of ESPN Stats and Info. So Bobby Bonilla, again, a second deferred contract plan with the Mets and Orioles paying him 500000 a year for 25 years. That, that began in 2004. So not only did he get 1.2 mil plus 8% interest just from the Mets, he also has something from the Mets again and the Orioles, which is another half mil. Great. So 
So he, I, again, I, he's living large. Yeah, he's living filthy. Large. Brett Saberhagen will receive 250 k a year from the Mets. Oh, goodness, New York, figure it out. For Man, 25 yeah, years. Money away. Right? So <laughs> he also got it for 25 years. That began in 2004 as well. The, the, this was the inspiration for Benia's deal. I, let that just rest yeah. where it needs to. <laughs> Max Scherzer will receive $105 million from the Nationals that will be paid out through 2028. Max Scherzer is still pitching in the league, so he's still making a ton of money. Let's look up Max Scherzer's contract for a moment. He's making $210 million over seven years' time. That's with the Texas Rangers. Scherzer signed in 2015, seven-year, $210 million contract. But a good chunk deferred money was an annual $15 million payments. So that's what we're looking at right there. Um, that was his contract. Seven years, 210 with the Nationals. He is now, is he pitching for the Rangers? I think he is. I think he makes like $12.5 pitching for the Rangers. So, again, Max Scherzer is just, he, he's, I guess we'll call him a freelancer because he's pulling in money left and right from, from other teams as well. Manny Ramirez collects $24.2 million from the Red Sox through 2026. Ken Griffey Jr. receives $3.5 million from the Reds every year through 2024. So that will end this year. But that was deferred from his nine-year, $116 million deal signed in the year 2000. Wow. 24 years later. I mean, this it's crazy. Chris Davis, he played for the Orioles. He was, he was good for like 10 minutes. This dude was not a good baseball player, but one season he hit like 60 home runs and the Orioles went nuts over him. Chris Davis had an arrangement that made him like the new Bobby Bonilla because he collects 59 million in deferred payments during a 15 year stretch that started last year and continues through 2037. He'll receive 9.16 million in 2024 and 2025. 3.5 million from 2026 to 2032 and 1.4 million from 2033 to 2037. Wow. So when, when I have kids and they're going through high school, he'll still be making millions of dollars. Yeah. So what you're saying is there's a lot of uh, wasted money just floating around in the major league baseball mm -hmm. system. And, and you know why? It's because there are no salary gaps. There's all not they have to, No, not in baseball. All, all you have to fight is the luxury debt. And so if you're only fighting that, what's the luxury tax? Yeah. Dude, it's the most confusing thing on the face of the earth. Well, then we and don't I have just, to go into it because it's going to make my brain hurt. And I don't need that. It's also known as the competitive balance tax, oh. okay? So it limits how much a team can spend on its roster. Okay. The tax is imposed every dollar spent above that threshold. So okay. it's like having a salary cap, but you're not actually kept to it. You just have to pay, you know, out, out, out the back end yeah. a ton of money in tax if you go over it, which is why Shohei Otani didn't take his $20 million today. It allowed the Dodgers to build a really competitive lineup in order to yeah, yeah. then have a World Series contending team. Yeah. But, yeah, that – it, it's – it's very confusing. I have a hard time following along. I didn't study math for a reason, so I, I don't want to go into statistics or luxury tax values or whatever it is. Right. All I know is this is the information, and I'm sharing it. I'm sharing the info. I, we can bring on a luxury tax expert to explain more things for us at a different point in time, but it's crazy. I, I, I'm looking at another link that says, how does Bobby Bonilla's deal compare to Otani's contract? And it says the biggest difference in the two deferral heavy deals is that Bonilla's came as a result of a buyout for an underperforming veteran, right? When you buy out somebody's contract, that means you suck and we want you off the team. We thought you were going to be good through this amount of time, but you're not. And Otani, on the other hand, was proposed by a superstar at the height of his free agency. So just think about that for a moment. Like you're, you're paying a guy because you're like, yeah, this dude's a beast. We're, we're paying to get the best out of him. Even though Otani didn't pitch this year, he's still one of the best baseball has ever seen. Meanwhile, Bobby Bonilla, he's 
kicking his feet up on the ottoman, eating popcorn, watching Shohei Otani, and just wiping his tears, not playing in Major League Baseball anymore with his $1.2 million check. Sounds pretty good to me. It's like in Dumb and Dumber when they're just sitting there watching that commercial. They're blowing their nose with it. Yeah. (laughs) That's what Bobby Benilla is doing. It's exactly the same thing. Love it. so here, I'm, I'll, I'll read you this because it, what, I was right about the 10-year length of his deal. So it's 10 years. Gosh, if you're getting 20 million over 10 years, that's what, 200 mil? 20? Yeah, 20 million every year? Yeah, that yeah, that would be 200 mil over 10 years, right? Yep. Why do I feel like it should be more than that? All right, Andrew, let's do some quick math. Shohei Otani contract. I feel like it's in the fours. Okay, so he he's making seven hundred million over ten years. Okay, so if he's making seven hundred million over ten years, carry the two. Do a little quick math there. So from twenty thirty four to twenty forty three, he'll receive sixty eight million per year. That's what it is. That's, so he so it. he's making two million, but he actually gets sixty eight million. I said he gets eighteen million. Yeah. I was just off by fifty. Oh, no big deal. Just 50 million. <laughs> Dropping the take. bucket to those guys. Give or take. So yeah. that's what Joey Otani gets. Um, it, it's crazy. How Bobby Bonilla's payment compares to 2024 MLB salaries. Okay. <laughs> this is insane. So, okay. Because baseball salary structure has young players that start their careers by earning just over half of Benia's annual, which is 1.19 million. The following players will be making less than Benia this season. Gunnar Henderson, who is one of the best young prospects in the game in the Orioles system. Garrett Crochet, who is a very good pitcher, but he, I mean, he's not really a full season guy yet. We don't really know how deep he can go because he's been hindered by injuries, but a good pitcher for the White Sox. We'll probably see his name pop up at the trade deadline. Ellie De La Cruz, who's one of the hottest bats in the game. You want this guy batting cleanup for you. He plays for the Reds. You have Duran, who closes games for the Twins, I believe. Um, you have Anthony Volpe, shortstop, young kid for uh, the, the Yankees. This is just a few. These guys, Cam, aren't making more than $810,000. Some of the best young names in baseball don't even come close to Bobby Benilla. And they have to prove themselves before they can get that, right? The restructuring of it. Like basically, hey, you're getting, you know, first year money. That's yes. expected. Yeah, and so they'll get paid. Right? Yeah. Gunnar yeah. Henderson will get paid. There, there's no issue there. All right. of these, Ellie de, Ellie de la Cruz will get paid. These guys will see their money eventually. But isn't it crazy that a guy could be sitting on his couch right now making more money than one of the best young players in baseball? That is, that is so wild. It's That's just crazy. a funny thing to think about. So happy belated Bobby Bonilla Day. Thank you. No, I'm looking forward to next year. No, no <laughs> next July 1st. Dollars. Yeah. When I break it down one more time and tell you <laughs> how the kid at the College World Series, uh, let's let's just say Drew Beam, pitcher for the Tennessee Volunteers, is making less money than Bobby Benilla again. Yeah. And speaking of the College World Series, what an event that was, huh? We had good times out there. So where were you most of the time? Because you were at the bar with us at one point shooting the pod. And yep. you kind of just were a floater. Yeah, uh, pretty much. I did whatever Sasha asked me to do. Fair. That's what I do. Most <laughs> of I'm guys. a floater too. I'm, you know, between her at media and her at sports, I kind of pick up wherever I can, wherever I can be helpful. Uh, but yeah, most of the time I spent at uh, either the Wilson store, there, the the bats and gloves store. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did some great sunflower baseball. seed table. Yeah, in there, in there. <laughs> Chinook, shout out, Chinook. Yeah. We we'll get up. them as a sponsor on this pod eventually. We should, we should definitely do that. But yeah, I teamed up with uh, with D1 Baseball. We did a couple podcasts with them from there. Uh, but most of the time, we were just hanging out at Zipline, and I did uh, you know, a couple shows with you, a couple shows with uh, Anna and Avery doing the Keep It Real stuff. So yeah, I was just kind of uh, making sure we were getting some content out there. That was my main gig. And that's what we did as well. Yeah, I never, never once set foot inside the, uh, the ballpark. Nor did I. I and you know what's around. funny? Most years I do, but... I gotta tell you, ticket prices were pretty, pretty expensive. Like maybe if you compare it to, and I, and I did this with Jack DeLongshaw on our College World Series final show. I'm like, well, some, yeah, really, really great guy, and does some great work with Pencil Talk. But I, I was talking to him, and I said, okay, well, if you're comparing World Series ticket prices, prices, which you know are probably 
five thousand dollars. I I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm shooting too high. Um, and you're comparing it to what the College World Series is like. Four hundred doesn't look that bad. But if you actually think about what the College World Series ticket prices were like just three four years ago, my buddy, not even a fan of this team, went to Mississippi State's College World Series. Cannot remember who they beat, but uh, he was at the College World Series final game. He sat in Mississippi State's fan section, which is already going to be more expensive. Mm-hmm. And he was four rows behind the dugout. How much money did he spend on his ticket? One single ticket? One ticket. He had two, but he sold the other one, made a, a crazy profit on it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say he spent $120. He spent $78. Shut up. $78 to go to the final game of that World Series. That's Either wild. the first or the final. It's one of the two. Uh, but he didn't spend more than that on either game. If he went to the first game, he only spent like 50 bucks. And then he spent 78 for the final. So I think it was the final. But that's crazy to think about. Because when I was looking at tickets just to go see Sunday's game in the blazing heat, the blazing Omaha heat, you wouldn't find a ticket in the third deck less than 350 bucks. That is insanity. Four rows off the field four years ago. 78 bucks, triple deck, the new triple deck at Charles Schwab, $350. Wild. So I couldn't make my way in because I, I didn't have a media badge. And that's okay because I, I actually really enjoy the outside stuff and I don't need to be inside. So I'd rather give it to another member of our herd at sports team than try to just take a pass to I don't know, take up space uh, is probably the best way to put it. I could have done some interviews on the field, but Anna and Avery knocked those out of the park. Rushed so I, uh, I chose to stay outside. And I love just being with the drunks. Uh, not that those are my people, but I just really enjoy the things that are said by drunk people. I've, I've been a huge people watcher for as long as okay. I, I, I can think back. And the College World Series is a prime time for people watching and people interacting. It All is. you have to do is sit down right outside the stadium on one of the, uh, um, you know, the ledges where there's trees planted and, and other uh, bushes. Just sit down on a ledge and just watch people at Rocco's. It's the it's it's better than watching your favorite team on TV. Yeah, these people are hilarious. I ran into the Napoleon Dynamite impersonator. Dude, that was a funny clip. That you what a out. what Very a goofball that guy is. I ran into him. I ran into just a bunch of random people. I didn't, you know, would it have been cool to say, hey, I was the one that interviewed Peyton Manning? Like, sure. I think that would be awesome. I, yeah. I'm, I bet Anna puts that in her, like, top five of people interviewed. Now, she did one a couple of years ago, but this one, like, it tops that because it was when the volunteers won and they were on the field. Yeah. I bet that's top five interview for Anna. But I don't know. I just... I think it's the MC in me that I love to be around the fans and play games with fans, shoot some goofy, loose content, things that, you know, when you're just scrolling Instagram late at night, you end up watching something because you want your brain's already in elevator music mode. So you're just waiting for the content to deliver what you what you're looking for. I love that. I, and, and I really enjoyed being outside. I have some great videos coming out about a uh, teaser teaser mm-hmm. Nebraska football schedule, <clears throat> some great videos uh, in terms of bowl game predictions, a father son interview should be coming out here shortly. There's a lot of great stuff I gathered out there that I would not have been able to do if I was in the stadium. So heard at sports, another big shout out to, you know, our company, we do it right. There's people out there that are trying to mimic what we do. And it's because we do it in such a way that is different. And we know how to balance the in and the out. When you can find that perfect marriage, that's what leads you to becoming a huge brand down there. Oh, they do the dance. Can yeah. do the dance. In three years time, this company was started in 2021. This entity of Bill's Heard at was yeah. started three years ago, 2022. So a full, we're just going full, full seasons here. Mm-hmm. Three years of College World Series coverage. Should we have a table? Should we have a booth 
in Baseball Village? Well, yeah. Three years. You think in three years? Oh, should we? No, but did we? Yes, because we're and awful. and that and that's right. all I need to say. Most people should not have a booth. A social media company should not have a booth at Baseball Village at, at all, right? But because because we know how to shoot content the right way, we know how to deliver things the right way. We get blessed by having a spot down there. Mm-hmm. By teaming up with Omaha Baseball Village, with other vendors, and showcasing the amazing things that happen out there at Charles Schwab. Yeah. And, you know, like you said before, um, that first year, it was just you and Sasha and Anna. Mm-hmm. And Grace. Team. And Grace. Yeah, you guys were the team. And now we've got, I think, 20 people on that team. It's at nuts. Least. Yeah. It is It is nuts. Uh, I mean, you can, there, are, there are so many people. I was talking about this with Sasha. And I, I don't want to I don't want this to become like, hey, I'm I'm tooting her dad's horn too much in, in, in the show. But you know, I was talking to Sash, and there are so many people in her dad's DMs. How do I get involved? How how can I join this team? Um, are you guys hiring interns anytime soon? Would you don't have those sort of messages if you aren't doing things in a fun mm-hmm. and um a, a results driven manner. Yeah. And the people want to be a part of this team. And you've seen the results. It's crazy. The people interaction. Want to be a part of this team. Yeah. And you know what? I, in the next episode, we'll record this on Tuesday. Sasha's going to join the show. Yeah. Um, a way to mirror off of this conversation, talking about doing things the right way. I don't know if you caught Matt Rule's interview with Joe, Joel Klatt this week, but we'll talk about that next Tuesday. And if you haven't, I highly recommend you go back and listen to it because when you talk about like being proud of something or like when you do things the right way, the results will come that hurt at sports, the way we, we are built, it's, it's the same way Matt rule is building Nebraska football. The results are there and the results are going to be there. And there's just a lot of like good bits and pieces that I want to break down with you guys. And just kind of talk about, because I've been saying it for a little while in terms of, hey, I think there's a huge shift taking place in college football outside of NIL. I think there's going to be great parity when it comes to the college football playoff. We'll get into that stuff. And Matt Rule had some good takes on that as well during that interview. But I think it's just kind of a great opportunity to just talk about what's going to come on this next episode and be like, This is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about Nebraska football. We're going to talk about that Colorado game. Everybody can't wait for that Colorado game. When I was up in Omaha, all people were talking about was, I can't believe we're playing a night game against Colorado. Deion Sanders doesn't know what's about to hit him. Like, it's going to be, it just, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. This season's going to be awesome. It sure is ramping up to be one of the best in recent history. So just, just a lot of cool things. Like the college world series was, was unbelievable. The volunteers, I, I actually can't believe they, they held on. I thought it was going to be a and series once they won game one. Now, I think the only way for this to have a game three was to see Texas A&M win game one. But in game two, Texas A&M, they didn't hold a commanding lead, but they held the lead for a while. It took about till the seventh or the eighth inning for Tennessee to really blow it to a five-run lead. But it wasn't over. Because in the ninth, a and put up four runs. They almost tied that game. Yeah. So Tennessee escapes to extend a game three. And, I mean, who doesn't love more baseball? I mean, that's the best thing, not only for the, the sport, but for the, for the city. Like, the economic impact of a game, having a game three was great for the city of Omaha. Yep. Rocco's was able to add more to their shot board. You had more people at the Blatt. They had to keep the rooftop open. Suck it, Blatt. You, you had to keep it open. Did you ever see the uh, the final shot toll? No, I, I actually didn't. Let's pull up those numbers because yeah. they weren't even close to what no. LSU put up last year. Yeah. Do you have the numbers in front of you? I do not have them, no. All but right. I think, like, at the last I saw, like, Tennessee was on top with 10, 10,000 or so. Well, if you – if you remember, Cam, if you remember, we uh, we had a little uh, a little competition, you, Anna, and myself, yeah, we did. about who we thought was going to win. 
And if you go back and listen, I'm pretty sure I had Tennessee and Texas A&M in it. I think you were you were poo pooing all over Texas A&M. No, I said those Texas A&M fans can drink. I said I hoped Trev Alberts. You, you hope know, the team loses gets, and goes away. Yeah, I hope right. All those Texas A&M fans buy a bunch of shots. Yep, right? but but I thought they were gonna buy a bunch of shots. But uh, I think I had it right. I think I had Tennessee all the way, unless unless I was riding my UNC high. And I put them in it, but I didn't think UNC would drink that much. So I, I think I separated game from shot. And I, I believe it was Tennessee, Texas A&M. I may have had Texas A&M winning just to be different, but I, that was my final Texas A&M, Tennessee. I'll go back and check it out. So 38,799. That's what Tennessee put away. Do you think Morgan Wallen or Peyton Manning had anything to do with that number? Probably a little bit. Yeah. I, don't know. I dropped some bones on it. I don't know, because like when last year when LSU was here and like word got out pretty quick that the Raising Cane's owner yeah. bought 20,000 jello shots, we didn't really hear anything like that with Tennessee or Texas A&M. So I don't know. I don't know if they had anything to do with it. Rumor was Morgan Wallen was going to end up at Rocco's, but I don't think he ever did. Yeah, but somehow Tennessee put away 38,000 shots. Yeah, I still don't understand how anybody, any fan base puts away a thousand, let alone thirty-eight thousand or sixty-eight thousand, which is what LSU did. Um, yeah, it's crazy. It's absolutely nuts. But good on Tennessee. They won the whole thing. They won the Jello shots. I think that kind of happens though when you go out and celebrate the College World Series. It, it, it's your fans that are going. To, like Texas A&M fans aren't ending up at Rocco's after they lose Game Three. Right. They're just not doing it. They're going home. They're salty. They're going back to the hotel. They're getting some sleep. They're going home. The volunteers, however, they're staying up to the break of dawn. Rally. Yeah. Rocco's stayed open five hours longer for those guys. That's not true. I I, I don't know. Maybe they stayed open five minutes longer. But I, that's probably the difference right there. 6,000 shots to follow a win. That's probably the difference. Yeah. So there's your update on the Jello Shop or just – an amazing event. We have a ton of amazing events coming up in Omaha, one being the Pinnacle Bank Championship that's coming up yeah. in August. We'll talk a little golf here soon. We'll break that down. I'll bring Kevin Price on the show. Kevin is – he's like – um, oh, what's his name? Name slipping – Ken Rosenthal. He's like Ken Rosenthal or Adam Schefter to their respectable sports. That's Kevin Price for Corn Ferry Tour Golf. Oh, Nice. He is an absolute lunatic when it comes to knowing the ins and outs of all of those people. We'll bring him on the show. We'll talk about PBC because that's a great event uh, as well. I'll be up that's in Omaha next one. week. Yeah, another one I heard at sports is all over. We are just always down there. We're having a good time. We're at the 17th hole again. Uh, so We we'll wouldn't be, be invited back. We wouldn't be uh, able to host um, like a, a tent, as Cam's talking about if we didn't conduct ourselves in such a way to get this far. Like, that's how proud I am of this team. And, and I hope that all these followers are just as proud of us as we are of what we built. For sure. And people I, were partying really out there with us, too. Like, we thought we were being loud because it's a golf course. <laughs> and they're like, nope, you guys keep doing what you're doing. This is awesome. So, like, Well, right. that hole is like the waste management hole. Yeah. It, it really is. It, it's like having a, a spot in Arizona on hole 16 – and you're ready to throw your beer if somebody puts one in the hole. Alejandro Tosti won last year. I remember after he sunk his putt for birdie, he birdied like six or seven in a row. When he sunk his putt, he's going like this to all the fans. He's like, get up! Yeah! Get up! He was living large. That dude couldn't have more fun on hole 17. That's, what's That's up. what we do. That's we, what we we're do. just there to have a lot of fun. It's a party. It's an absolute party. So... Just a lot of fun things uh, to kind of talk about. I do have one like minor poll question. It's more localized to where I'm at right now, but I, I kind of want to like leave this out there and maybe we can revisit it at a later date. So I, I like giving back at, at like camps and such here in town. And that's what I'm, um, I'm currently doing. I'm sitting in a, a spot, a classroom right now, just taking like a little bit of time away. And then I'm going to go back down to the kids, but I'm looking at like a bunch of these, young kids in messy jerseys, okay? Inter Milan, or Inter Milan, Inter Miami, messy jerseys. And the question was posed to me today, 
and and this is what it was. I'll, I'll say it and then I'll I'll break it down a little bit more. The question: Do more kids in St. Louis own or or maybe parents bought a messy jersey for their kid than owning a St. Louis City jersey, your home team's jersey? Do you think more kids own or a parent has bought a messy jersey for their kid? in a town that has another MLS team that is so diehard that they sell out every match for St. Louis City? I think it's an interesting question because tons of kids love Messi. He's the biggest name in soccer. Tons wear his jersey. And I also see a lot in St. Louis City jerseys. But do you think Messi holds, like, do you think the needle leans more toward Messi or do you think it leads more to the hometown team camp, like just your honest thoughts. Yeah, I think Messi for sure. Just because I see, I see so many people wearing Messi jerseys. Isn't that crazy though? In a yeah. town that sells out every match, has a very good soccer team. Last year they were much better than they were this year, but a good soccer team. People love St. Louis City here. Yeah, I see so many kids in jerseys, but yet when I'm out and about, I see more in Messi jerseys than I do in City jerseys. It's gotta be. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? So isn't that weird. I feel like I'll, I'll post that to my Twitter today yeah. at some point. I, I, I got, I got to get that question, that question out there. We also talked a lot about trade deadlines. We talked, we started with MLB. We'll end with MLB here. We talked about trade deadlines. That's coming up July 31st in major league baseball. What team needs are for, for everybody. We, we spoke a lot about the Cardinals uh, today in my circle. And there were a lot of good back and forth of, what do they actually need? Do they need another bullpen arm? Do they need a starter? Do they need a bat? And I'm going to tie this right back into the College World Series, and we can break this down at a later date once the deadline approaches. But I think teams need to get out of their own way and their own head of, oh, we've been grooming this guy for years in our farm system, and we're just waiting for him to be the next big thing. Stop getting attached to your players. These players, it's a business. They know that they could leave or get sent away at any point. Stop getting attached to your guys of, oh, Tink Hens, number one prospect in the Cardinal system. Like, oh, Gordon Graceffo, also one of the top prospects in the Cardinal system. Like, who knows if they're ever going to be good in the league? So don't get attached to these guys. Send them away in trades and build your team that way. If you have to send a big body like a Goldschmidt, to the Yankees who are in need of a first baseman right now to in return, get a, a really strong, solid starting pitcher or another bullpen arm or a better bat, whatever it is you do that. And you don't get attached to these young guys because they could either pan out or they wouldn't, or, or they won't like, think about like those that are coming over from the college world series. The only sure thing last year was Paul Skeens. The only sure thing. Now, Wyatt Lankford uh, was, was another one that, you know, played for that Florida team and, you know, there, there are a lot of like, you know, potential sure things. Dylan Cruz is a potential sure thing. But like this year, like you have Jack Caglione, who, who is the Florida pitcher, hitter. He's probably more of a sure thing over anything else, but could end up being a bust too. Uh, a lot, so many of these people can just end up as busts. So don't hold on to them forever. Feel free to deal them. Stop getting attached to these guys. You can pay somebody else the bare minimum in order to not go above your luxury tax uh, um, tax, or, you know, um, find a way to restructure contracts uh, the way that you want to. But I, I think GMs, managers, front office people just need to get out of their own way and just feel free to deal because those number one to number five prospects in your system aren't guarantees. So why wouldn't you send them away for somebody that is a guarantee right now? Isn't that the whole point of a trade deadline is to go out and get a guarantee for your team so that you're set up for the playoffs? It's not about what you're building for. So I was on a little bit of a rant today. I was going to say, yeah, get off your soapbox already. I, I, I can't. I can't. I'm <laughs> repping my uh, Ken Griffey Jr. Mariners jersey out of nowhere today. I'm feeling good. I'm in love of. I'm in love with baseball. The Omaha hat, the MLB jersey. That's what we focused on today, and that is why Rogers rules. That's why you show up for Rogers rules. Sasha will join the show next Tuesday. We're taking the day off for the Fourth of July. We hope you have a safe and enjoyable holiday. Don't get shot by any fireworks. It Keep seems like. Digits. 
seems like somebody always comes back with a story of, oh, boy, did I have a close call. Let's not have any close calls this year. None of that. Let's come back with all of our limbs attached and enjoy some Nebraska football, a breakdown of Matt Rule and Joel Klatt's interview with Sasha Durkin next Tuesday. Another episode of Rogers Rules. Cam and I love you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you then.